Chitraj, you can begin. We are live on YouTube. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ideas in your mind have no patent value. They must be expressed or reduced to practice before it's too late. A pleasant and good morning to everyone. On the behalf of Department of Law, Prestige Institute of Management and Research in Dhaka, I would like to welcome our esteemed guest, Ms. Niharika Salar, ma'am, respected faculties, and all dear students. It's my great honor and privilege to welcome our guest, Ms. Niharika Salar, ma'am. Ma'am has pursued her B.L.L. degree from National University of Study and Research in Law, Ranchi. from National University of Singapore in specialization of intellectual property and technology laws ma'am has completed her legal internships under C&V Law Associates Jaggi and Jaggi Associates HSA Associates Remfri and Sagar Associates Vohra and Vohra and RK Divan company ma'am has also been a graduate student researcher in the year 2019 and 2020 for the university National University of Singapore The areas of interest for ma'am are trademark laws, intellectual property theory, social legal theory, and legal education. Ma'am has presented papers and has also published papers in reputed and scholarly journals, like on the topic misuse of Section 498A IPC and the procedure related to it in in India, published in International Journal of Legal Research. Currently, ma'am is working as an assistant professor of law. at nasa university of law hyderabad ma'am is also member of editorial board at extra cover the sports law blog of india and advisory board member at kartavyam ngo in today's session ma'am is going to enlighten us about the intellectual property protection in art now i request ma'am to kindly take over the session thank you Hello. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I can clearly see that you have gone through my LinkedIn profile and have looked at some really old internships, which will which were done way back in time. And at that point of time, I really had no clue what uh, my interests were. Um, so thank you for that, and um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I really think that. covid i mean these these are some of the brighter things which covid has brought us uh, you know i am here i'm 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 working in hyderabad but i'm currently in jamshedpur and i'm delivering my lecture in indore so and the, the best part about all of this is that it has really increased access to to to, to you know the good resources which was otherwise probably outside access or just difficult to access you know given uh, so many logistic issues um i thank you um shitaj you have been really wonderful you have been uh, very uh, kind and very uh, uh, you know proactive in giving me all the details i thank dr uh, professor kamlesh chain who was kind enough to call me yesterday and just uh, confirm all of this uh, professor nakul chauhan and last and not the least department of law prestige institute of management and research Uh, so without a further ado i will just quickly share my slides and then we can quickly start in now i've been told that i have a time of uh, one hour so i will uh, um take approximately that amount of time and then we can follow with the uh, way that will be followed with any questions um, if you have any now i don't have access to the chat rather it's difficult for me to look at my chat right now so please uh, Do not mind if I'm unable to uh, look at your messages. Uh, I'll take up all of that in the end, and I hope Shitaj will, will help me in that. So, sure. just quickly confirming: uh, Can all of you see my slides, and can all of you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Now, when I was asked what I wanted to talk about, I uh, intellectual property is something which I have been looking at, uh, especially from the legal angle, from the legal side. and it's it's a huge huge topic uh even if i brought it down into various aspects and i chose to do something on art that itself again is a very broad topic and faculty members um, who are here in this room will agree with me that the most difficult challenge for us as faculty members is to give you so much of information in limited period of time so in this one hour i will try to um cover whatever is possible in art and i am being told that uh, this lecture is being attended by law students so i am assuming that you have some idea or the audience members in general have some idea about how law functions in general and uh, what limitations are what exceptions are 
But nevertheless, I'll still walk you through it to give you some very brief idea. Now, the roadmap for this lecture is as follows. I wanted to start off with uh, a case study. And the idea is to introduce you to this particular case study, which happened just last month. And I will want you to keep that in your mind before we proceed. And once you have those thoughts in your head, I would then want to talk about the idea of intellectual property in general. Oh, I can already spot um, a spelling error, so please avoid that. Uh, so I, want to, I will be then taking you through the general idea of intellectual property protection. And then I want to talk about how the conundrum with intellectual property legal protection is conflicting with the idea of art in general. Now, just to be very clear, when I'm talking about art here, I want to talk about general forms of art, like appropriation art, paintings, um, photo photography, and all of those aspects where intellectual property, especially copyright law, plays a huge role. And after we have gone through all of that, I will then take you back to the case study. And then I would want you to think that how you would apply those principles, if at all, you had to represent any of the parties. So quickly talking about the case study. Now, last month, this artist called Alex Tarkote, he came up with this installation called As Long As The Sun Lasts for the 2021 Roof Garden Commission. And this was commissioned at the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And you can see a picture uh, of the installation. Just to give you uh, more um, pictures of how it looks like, it's essentially this huge big bird with a ladder in his or her hand. And now mind you, Forte went ahead and told that he is not uh, attributing any gender to the bird. So we'll just stick to no pronunciations. So here she is with the ladder, sitting on the moon. Um, apparently there is some meaning attached to it. And uh, as you can see in these detailed photographs, he used these thin plates. Uh, you know, for, for the feathers as a part of this installation. Now, I, this is the fun part, actually. Whenever I talk to students with respect to intellectual property, I make a lot of pop law references because that's a part of, of, uh, of what I do. That's, that's the name of the elective, which I teach back at my part, law and pop culture. And the interesting part is that every time when I refer to something, I feel that the students know about it, but they, look at me at the blank faces and and that that, really, that, that, that gives me the, the the idea of how much of a deep gap there already is so keep this in mind and now i want you to uh, look at this poster of this very popular children's show called sesame street now sesame street is an american educational uh, children's television series and um, as some of you may be aware, if at all you had a chance to watch it, because Sesame Street, the Indian version of it was also very popular. You could see the big bird going around singing in Hindi. And, uh, you know, the show in general combined live action, sketch comedy, and in general animation. And just to give you some facts, uh, this, this, this came into being uh, back in 1996. And um, you can see that there are various characters in it. And I want you to think about the yellow board which you see. The name of the yellow bird, the character, is uh, the big bird. And I want you to think if at all there are any similarities between the yellow bird, which you are seeing on the screens right now as part of Sesame Street, the show, and the installation which Kote did just a month ago, which we saw in the previous screen. Now we'll come back to this and uh, we'll now talk a little bit about how intellectual property in general functions, and then probably things will become more clear. Now, why I'm why I'm doing is because I I want you to I want you to think that if at all these 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 concepts which we'll talk about would be applicable if you know these two parties went to a court of law deciding to sue each other for corporate infringement. Now, in general, what is intellectual property? Every time I take take up these classes. I feel that this is the most basic question and I see people and I see people ignoring it altogether. But you need to understand what is intellectual property in general, because only then you will know that what is suitable for protection, for legal protection to be specific. Now, intellectual property in general is an umbrella term which is uh, used for a set of assets which could be intangible in nature and they're not physical in nature. 
and the and the core idea remains that it has to be a creation of your mind and it has to come out from your thought process it could be an invention it could be a literary or a artistic work or it could be design anything now i'm sure most of you have heard about various intellectual property rules right like trademark copyright patent and i'm not really sure if uh, how many of you are exactly aware of it so i will keep my speed medium now what you see on this on your screens right now is this very popular photograph called and it was titled the afghan girl it became really popular uh, various similar copies were made out of were uh, made of it you see a picture of the uh, big popular banarasi silk sari which has a gi tag attached to it it's called geographical indication and i'll i'll visit it again you see a book you see a you see a poster um, an advertisement poster this is a nike poster which featured the very popular golf for tiger woods you see the cover photo of a very popular song blurred lines and you see a shaver in front of you this is the philips shaver now mind you all of these things which you see on your screens they were the crux of some or the other intellectual property litigation now why i'm trying to what i'm trying to tell you is that all of these aspects a song a clock a photo an invention the the shaver which you see a poster a book they can all be intellectual property and this is where we as lawyers well, not me but with lawyers or or people in this fraternity come in and they 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 fight for intellectual property protection for for right protection in these creations or also I missed out the very famous Louis Vuitton brand a trademark now the the general idea is that why should intellectual property be protected in general and there are various theories attached to it and i want to give you an example um or let's say i'll visit this example after i have covered these theories in the end now theories is the most boring part of everything because uh students tend to skip this students don't believe that uh you know or theory that nothing in theory but to understand any concept you need to understand that all of these theories have played a very crucial role in how these legal protections have evolved in the years and these theories you i mean if you start applying them you can apply them in almost all contexts not intellectual property but criminal law constitutional law everything now personality theory as some of you may already be aware of it's essentially uh, i mean the roots of it is in personhood theory of, of real property and you you the, the idea always remains that intellectual property is essentially an extension or 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 a manifestation of the creator's personalities and the idea of personality theory is that this creation has to be appreciated and how do you appreciate it you do it by appreciating the creator so the idea is that the artist defines herself or himself in and through the art and in which they believe that they are entitled to considerable protection there's also the very popular fairness theory and you can find um, aspects of fairness theory in other roots like the very famous lockin theory of labor now lockin now john lock said back in the time that i mean of course back then there were no artists per se there were there, there, there uh, farming was was a very popular uh, or was the thing of uh, of uh, monetization and resources so what he said was that if a farmer puts in his blood and sweat in in the soil and then and then you know uh, puts in efforts for the soil to come up rich and green whatever comes out of that soil is something which only the farmer has a right on that's the law in theory of labor now it has evolved into various principles and for the for the purpose of intellectual property rights fairness theory is something which then comes into handy and the right and and the idea is that if i'm putting my resources if i'm putting my effort in the creation then i ought to get some protection in it and the main reason is also that uh you know any kind of a protection uh, has to be given to someone who has uh, given some effort to it now there's also welfare theory and again i mean i don't know how many of you uh, or or what your are, are the students um, in but if you have uh, taken the jewish the jewish classes then you know that utilitarianism is something which essentially tells you that uh, the, the the greater good of the greater society has to be taken into consideration 
Now I know all of this may may seem very boring to you, so let's look at it as an example. What you see on your screens is PPT slides, right? And if some of you were observant enough, you could see that some of these slides had my copyright under it. You 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 could see that that one of that that some of these slides uh, had copyright in Article 121 or rights reserved written on it. So the idea is. But I went on to the I went on to the internet. I looked for some some different templates. I wanted to make uh, I wanted to make an effort to make these people these sites interesting so that students actually listen to me and not sleep behind the closed camera. So that's my personality theory. So I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to put in my personality in it that you know it's 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 a little colorful. It's not dead. It's not boring. I'm trying to catch your attention. Personality theory. I also put in my efforts. I put in my time. I could have easily watched some series yesterday, but I was sitting and working on these slides all day long. So I need to get some protection on it, right? Fairness theory. All the faculty members out there who put in their efforts to create these lesson plans, to create these PPT slides, they need to get some protection. More protection the faculty members get over their work, the greater society is happier. Welfare theory. Now the all of these combined. The basic rule of why intellectual property protection should exist is that it induces creativity. If I knew that some of you may be actually clicking screenshots of these slides, and then you will make similar copies of it, and or probably you will start distributing it to your friends for some money, then there is no motivation for me to to make these slides, right? I can easily make something of substandard quality. Because I know that somebody or the other will always copy it and then make other copies of it, so there is no motivation for me. But now, when I know that I have copyright on this, and if any student screenshots this or tries to create similar copies, I can potentially drag the student to a court of law for copyright infringement. So that gives me motivation to 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 make these slides even better. And what's happening then? It, it's 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 potentially helping in a better educational give and take, and that's what I like to believe. All of this is on the on the presumption that that these slides are apparently interesting. I don't know if students will agree with me or not. So uh, this is why essentially intellectual property has to be protected, and these are the basic theories of um, you know why why are we even talking about it today? Now, when somebody gets rights over these, WIPO says, and by WIPO I mean the World Intellectual Property Organization. It says that you can get two kinds of rights. There's of course economic rights and there's of course moral rights. Now, in terms of economic rights, the general principle is that nobody can monetize over a copied creation. So, if I have put in some efforts, I need to get the monetization. I need to get the commercial um, aspect of it. I need to get the money out of it. Nobody else can free ride over a uh, similar work which is made. And there's of course moral rights. So, for example, if you if if you if you put in some effort in a creation and somebody copied it, and somebody started distorting the uh, the work, or somebody started mutilating it, there are these three terms: distortion, mutilation, destruction, which is given up in the Copyright Act. Then your moral rights are hurt. That is, you put in some effort in a creation that creation represented you, and that creation was destroyed brutally. Your moral rights are hurt. Now, moral is something very, uh, very uh, recent because up till now, a lot of intellectual property was all about money. But now, more and more uh, people are talking about how they are in, irrevocably attached with their creation, and that's the reason why I thought talking about art in this lecture would be more interesting. So, these are some of the rights which talks about which you talk about. But the interesting part is also that not everyone gets all rights over it. So I just wanted to quickly talk about this particular case, and here, as some of you have also, I don't know, some of you may have seen, uh, there was this, there is this particular show called India's Best Drama Buzz by Z Entertainment um, Enterprises, and this was essentially a televised um, talent hunt show for child actors in a in a particular age, and they said that Sony infringed its copyright and its concept note and its production bible. Now, what's a production bible? You may be thinking it's essentially this this sort of master document 
and it's meant for the production in, in, in question. It's a very it's a very common thing in the in the in the entertainment industry. And every time you you approach um, you know an IP lawyer, especially in Bombay or or, or an entertainment lawyer, production library plays a really crucial role because it's essentially talking about the concept of the show. So they said that these two shows are very similar in nature. So what the court essentially thought, and this was a Bombay High Court judgment recently, and it said that these things are very common in the industry because you have so many reality shows out there which where you have this, this segment of three panel judges, they're sitting on an elevated uh, on an elevated panel, and there are some common elements which are bound to be found. And nobody can go about claiming protection over, over these, these concepts because they are so common. Now, this is another aspect of intellectual property protection. It's always the tussle between private rights and, and public rights. Private rights, people believe that, that we need to get intellectual property protection because of these theories that you just spoke about. But the public rights, uh, people believe that, that if you started giving copyright protection to everything, then you're essentially limiting access. And, and that's why the tussle always exists in intellectual property. So this case is an example of how court said that you can't go about copywriting everything. Or even if you can, you can't go about suing each and every one for corporate infringement because in similar industries, similar elements are bound to happen. Now, intellectual property protection um, can be given in various aspects. 1130 already, there's this copyright law, there's trademark law, uh, and and you have the, the Design Protections Act, and you have all of these aspects. Now, I will not go into all of this detail, but the general idea is that copyright gives protection in a kind of work, in an artistic work. Trademark gives protection in symbols, and the underlying idea of trademark law protection is that if you look at a symbol, you know that where these products are coming from. So if you went to the market, and you say like a Nike shoe, and you, you, I mean, you bought it, you took it home, you liked it, and you wanted to get it again. So you went to the market again, and now you're looking for the same Nike shoe. And what really helps you in going back to Nike is the Nike swoosh. The tick is called the Nike swoosh, so the brand logo of the, of, of the company. So what the Nike swoosh is essentially doing is that it's helping you recognize that these products are by the brand Nike, you liked Nike and you want to buy it again. So Nike swoosh needs to be protected because no, because no other company can come in and then and then sell products under the same Nike swoosh, but they are not Nike, right? So that's that's what trademark law is essentially trying to protect. Patent law is trying to protect inventions. They are a different domain altogether of intellectual property protection because they are something which is not about creative protection. They're more about novel creations, they're more about useful things which may be helpful to you and that needs protection. So, so it goes under the AI technological aspect. You have the designs protection, you have the geographical indications protection. Geographical indication essentially uh, giving protection to a certain bunch of people who come from a certain community and they know that this particular aspect or this particular product is or, or this particular creation comes out only from that area. So you have Darjeeling tea. You have Banarsi uh, uh, Sari, you have Lucknowi chicken, and, and all of uh, those aspects. Now, intellectual property is a very dynamic uh, legal wing. So these were the traditional aspects. You also have these, these newer aspects coming in. You have trade secrets. A Coca-Cola recipe needs to be protected. Otherwise, anyone and everyone will start making Coca-Cola. And it would be an infringement for the original Coca-Cola. You also have personality rights. Amitabh Bachchan's voice sounds in a certain way. When you hear Amitabh Bachchan's voice uh, in that uh, polio advertisement, you are immediately recalled that it is Amitabh Bachchan. It's, it's Amitabh Bachchan's persona. If somebody else started recreating that voice, then Amitabh Bachchan can possibly sue that person for violation of personality rights. Uh, now, that again is another huge concept altogether, and I'll not go into it in detail. I want to talk more about art today. Now, let's, let's, look at it, let's look at this example. And this is where I want to talk about how complications can come up in intellectual property and in art. 
Now, what you see on your screen is a photograph of Oscar Wilde, which was clicked by Napoleon Sarone. And when you talk about photography, the question of authorship and ownership always comes into picture. Because intellectual property protection really is all about who is the author and who is the owner, because only the owner can get those uh, protection rights, right? Like we spoke about moral rights, economic rights. So in this case, when you talk about photography, the photographer is, is the author. And that's the basic idea, right? I mean, of course, the, 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 the photographer clicked the picture and therefore he's supposed to get protection over the photograph, right? But that's the basic idea and that's what we're all used, used to. But what if, I mean, what if the photographer was assisted by somebody? Uh, so would it be a case of joint authorship? Or would it be a case of sole authorship only in the photographer? Like, for example, there's something called um, amanuensis. And it's essentially a person who helps uh, the author or who helps the photographer. It's, it's a very common term in the entertainment industry. You're, hold, you're holding a camera, the photographer, and the amanuensis will help you with the cable. You know, all those kinds of things. So what happens if the person who's assisting you gives you more ideas? Like, hi, um, why don't you ask Oscar Wilde to sit in a certain position? Or why don't you ask Oscar Wilde to hold the book? Because this photograph might have been different if, if Oscar was not holding the book per se. What if that particular furry chair was not there in the photograph? Did the assistant help the, did the, assistant help the phot photographer to put in that chair? Because what you see in your screen is just a photograph. But actually, there are some creative choices which have been taken to make this photograph what this photograph is now. If this chair was not there, then, this, then the aesthetics of this photograph might have been completely different. And that's why people who argue that whether the photographer needs to be given protection or not, those who argue that the photographer needs to be get needs to needs to get protection. Uh, uh, they say that the, that the photographer takes some creative choices. He has put his mind. He has put his efforts in placing the person, in placing the objects, in, in placing the lights, in placing the angle of the camera, in placing uh, you know other aesthetics. You see that there is a carpet in the photograph. What if that carpet was not there? Would it would it have been a different photograph? You see that this photograph is in a particular filter. It's in a hazy filter. It's not the it's not the usual black or white, or it's not the usual color photograph. These all creative choices are being taken by the photographer, and therefore he needs to get protection. But on the other hand, those who argue that photographers do not need to get protection, they say that the photographer is only recording some real elements. The photographer just clicked the picture of an existing person. That's essentially news reporting, and that's essentially capturing already existing facts. So what creativity is there in it? And therefore, the photographer does not uh, you know, need to get protection. So these are some dilemmas which come into place when you talk about protecting the photographer. You also have other examples. What you see in front of you now is this particular abstract expression, which was titled Autumn, Rhy Autumn Rhythm. And this was by this artist called um, Taxi Below. Now, what again you see on your screen may appear to be just a scribble of black and white dots, and, and you know, just just some something is happening in this photograph. And some of you may even be thinking, you, oh, I can also do this, you know, at my home. I can just, you know, you know those those tactics: the toothbrush you paint, and then you just sprinkle, and then you can create a similar painting. But mind you. This was one of the most popular works of 1950s. This is considered to be a distinguished example of Bloch's work. And it's actually one of his most notable works. It's just a Google search, which is just Google it. And, and you will see so, many, uh, so much information about this painting. So those who say that this needs to get protection, they say that Bloch was again taking some creative choices. He carefully placed these black and these white and these cream, these 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 cream lines under a backdrop. It's not random. He knows what is going on in this painting, and and it was planned, even though it looks very chaotic. 
So you see that these bunch of executive decisions were taken by, by the paint and therefore he needs to get protection. Another example, these are just some paintings, again, which may appear to you uh, as nothing but just color blocks, but, but they are essentially called Rothko paintings because uh, this was done by this artist called Mark Rothko. And again, uh, much to, I don't think now, now anyone will be surprised because if I'm talking about it, then, it's, then I'm talking about for a reason. But again, they were really popular works. Um, they, 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 as you can see, they depict these irregular and they depict these painted uh, uh, blocks. And they were again, very popular from 1949 to 1970. And again, what people say is that some decisions were made, some creative choices were made. They are not just two rectangles. He carefully placed the red rectangle over the blue rectangle in the picture which you see on the left of your screens, because only the blue helps the red bring out the redness of it. If the red was placed with some other color, then probably the red wouldn't look as bright. These are again some creative choices which are made. So it's not so simple as it may appear. And there, there must be some reason why all of these paintings have become so popular, right? Not not everyone on the on the earth can can be extremely uh, mindly if I'm cursing stupid about it. I mean, you know, there must be some reason. So these are so these dilemmas are there in intellectual property. But how do you go about protecting art? How do you go about giving copyright protection in all of these artworks? One dilemma which I wanted to also talk about in, is in the form of this very popular case called Monkey Cypher Case. Uh, any intellectual property enthusiasts in the class might already be aware of this case. It's, it's, it's titled Naruto versus Skato. And as you can see, um, in 2011, a picture was clicked by mistake. And this picture is something which you can see on the left of your screen. It's, it's of this black Macau in Indonesia. It's, it's, a, it's a type of monkey, which, which, fine, which, is, uh, which is there, which is very popular in Indonesia. And this photographer uh, called uh, uh, David Slater, he was there in Indonesia researching about these species of monkey. And what happened uh, on his own account is that one of these monkeys um, hijacked his camera and uh, started, started the, you know, uh, aimlessly clicking the, the, the button. And of course, I think it's only safe to assume that the monkey didn't know what he's actually doing. And the result was a lot of blurry pictures but also some of some pictures were really stunning and beautiful, which again, you can see on your screens. So the question was that who would have copyright protection over this photograph? Would it be the monkey? Because, because uh, you know, the monkey clicked the picture, but the monkey didn't know what he knew what he was doing. Or would it be the photographer, David Slater? Because the photographer was actually contending in the court of law that it was only when he coaxed the monkey, he took in, he, he only when he got really comfortable with the monkey after tremendous effort, efforts, he could actually then, uh, you know, get the monkey to be very comfortable with him. And only then the monkey got the courage and the, and the confidence to come and grab his camera and then take photos and you have this. Now, uh, this, this case went up to courts because this picture became very popular. You could see, I mean, um, Wikipedia started posting these pictures without the photographer's consent and the photographer contested it. At the highest level of court, which is a US case, uh, court was of the opinion that constitutional rights are only given to a person. An animal is not given any such rights. So by the time this, this case went into appeal, there was, uh, I mean, both the parties reached to uh, a settlement. The settlement amount was obviously not disclosed, but the main uh, takeaway from this case was that only human beings could be, uh, you know, owners of any of any intellectual property, and therefore, uh, you know, liable of any copyright protection. Now. Art has gone up to more things than we have thought of. Some of you may be aware of this particular form of art called appropriation art. And what appropriation art is essentially, is it's a term which is used for copying existing images in their art with little transformation from the original. 
And Jeff Koons is a very popular case study because he's one of the most famous appropriation artists. He's notoriously known for copying a lot of already existing work. So you see the left of your screen, some of you may have recognized that it's a copy or it's, it's, it's a utilization of this character called the Pink Panther. Uh, the second, which you see on your screen, the middle picture, it's a copy of a very famous popular cartoon uh, called uh, Popoy. Now, does Jeff Kuhn get to get any protection over this appropriation art? There are various questions which are attached to it. And before I move on to his case studies, I want to talk about one more particular um, concept of intellectual property, and that may help us to get more idea. Not all kind of copyright protection is possible. Some copying is also allowed, and, and people who are copying such intellectual property can get away. Now there are, there are essentially two kinds of systems which countries all over the world follow. Some of you may know this, and it's a huge topic in its own. It's called fair use. Now fair use is essentially this uh, multi-factor ad hoc analysis. And what it does is that it, it's, 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 it's subjecting the usage or the copying to four factors. And it is checking that whether the copied use can fall within these four factors or not. And the four factors, as you can see on your screen, is the purpose and character of the use, is the nature of the copyrighted work, um, is the amount and substantiality of the work taken, and the effect of the use upon the potential market. Now, the question here is that if somebody is copying these slides, Again, I'm, I'm coming back to these slides as an example because I think it, it helps in it, it helps in the creativity flow. Yeah, it, it helps in understanding better. So if somebody started using these slides, the, the court will then see that whether the usage or what's the purpose of that usage, you know, why, why is the person actually copying my, my slides? The court will see what is the nature of my work, what is the nature of these slides. Now, the idea is to see that whether this work is published or unpublished. And if the work, I mean, that, that it really helps in understanding uh, what is the nature of the copyrighted work. And the amount and substantiality of the portion taken is the third essential factor, which, is, which essentially asks that whether the whole work was copied or whether some part of the work was copied. And the last factor is the effect of the use upon the potential market. The question always is that whether my audience will be affected with that copied use. Would it, would it result in my audience leaving my work and go to that copied work? And therefore, that's the effect of the use upon the potential market. Now, of course, in this slides, my, my, in this slides case example, my audience would be my students. For this, for this case, it would be you. So if somebody else comes up and started giving out similar slides, would you all leave my lecture and go to that lecture? <laughs> that's, 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 that's not a very good example to say because actually we would want that more. We want more faculty. We want more people to talk about intellectual property. Uh, and I would be glad if somebody else also comes up and starts talking about these topics. But, but, you, but, you, but you get the idea. The question always is that if my potential market would be affected or not. Now that's one way of looking at it. The other you say, I'm sorry, that was a slip. The other uh, thing is fair dealing. And fair dealing is something which is looked as an, ex as an exception in Commonwealth countries. It was essentially, a, uh, it was essentially an English law principle. And uh, of course, as some of you may be aware, our, a lot of our laws is taken from the UK. So even we follow fair dealing here in India. And a lot of other Commonwealth countries like well, New Zealand and Australia, they have fair dealing. Now, the question is always that whether the fair dealing is used for a specific purpose or not. Is it for criticism? Is it for review? Is it for some private or personal research? Or is it for news reporting? And if they fall within these brackets, then there would be fair dealing. Now, the core agenda of both these principles is the same that some kind of copying has to be allowed for the welfare of the society. Not everything can be protected. Now, to give you an example, I have this pen with me. And uh, 
this is um, a Waterman Paris original. Uh, my, my, my dad uh, gave it to pass it on to me. Now there is some intellectual property protection in this. The way this pen looks, the way the cap is. Now, if if everyone's if if they had intellectual property protection over this, limited property protection over this, then it's great. But if this but if they started suing every other pen which is made out in this way, then imagine we as students and academics may not have access to a lot of products. We may have to pay a lot of money for the original pen, and not everyone would be able to afford that. So you see, some limitation on protection is always important. It's and it's it's an all it's an all factor, right? It's, it's it's criminal law. Some amount of killing is allowed. Some I put it in a very blunt way, but but you but you get the idea. There are there are always some exceptions, and that's the same for copy use. So the core principle of both these concepts are same. But the but the main difference is that fair use is a defense approach. What 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 ha what is happening here is that. The court will say that you were that you were uh, you know responsible for copyright infringement, but because your use falls in these four factors, we will let you go. Fair dealing, on the other hand, is an is an exception approach. It's telling you from the very beginning that because it was for news reporting, there is no usage of copyright at all. So, so this is the core difference between fair use and fair dealing. It's very thin, but it's it's very crucial to understand how limitations work. So I wanted to talk about this before we go back to Jeff Jones. And now let's think about these, these few cases. Now here, as you can see, uh, Rogers versus Coons, it, it was a very popular case where this artist came across this photo, photograph, which you see on the left of the screen. And uh, he saw that it was a very homely picture of this old couple holding these beautiful puppies. And what he did was that he sent this picture to his artisans in Italy. And he asked them to, read, to, to come up with an installation which looked exactly like this. And the result is on the right of your screens, which is the installation which was done by, by uh, Koons. And the, the idea here was that, that Koons, planned, Koons wanted to profit out of, these, out of the exploitation of uh, this particular photograph, right? So if you're, if you're essentially selling off this installation for a lot of money, you are, you are making some monetary benefits out of it. But the monetary benefits was not because of your effort or, 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 or because of your intellect. It was because of somebody else's effort. It was, it was, it was because of somebody else's photo, photograph. And that is what copyright law is trying to protect, protect the original creator from. So, so in this case, court felt that because, it, because this particular work was meant for a lot of uh, monetization, Effort. I mean, I mean, you know, Coons went ahead and he displayed his installation, made money out of it. It was considered, it was considered to be a, a copyright infringement because that is an exclusive right, which is only, which is supposed to only lie with the original photographer. Another very quick example, and like I said, Coons is a very popular appropriation artist, and, and he really tested the 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 untested waters between art and between intellectual property. And that has really helped in understanding how uh, protection has gone. Now I see students scribbling, but don't worry, if you want, I can send these slides to you. Don't don't listen listen to me what I'm trying to say. It will make more sense to you. Uh, anyway, so what I was trying to say was that this particular case was all about uh, you know this this photograph. Which was which was which was uh, clicked by this photographer called Andrea Blanche, and this had copyright in it because it was essentially titled Silk Sandals, and this was this was for a magazine cover shoot, and it and it uh, displayed Gucci's original shoes. Now a similar or a part of this photograph was taken in another installation work, which was by Gunz. And this was one of his works, and it was it as you can see, it's essentially the, these uh, photographs of these, you know, rotated legs. And if so, and, and if some of you started pointing out, you can probably also see similarity in the second uh, leg, you know, from the left in the picture on your right. You can see that these sandals are very similar to the original photo. You can see that the position of the legs are very similar to the photo. And, and Coons is trying to monetize this. Coons is trying to make a lot of money out of it. But Coons also explained that this picture has a very different meaning. 
while the original photo uh, photograph had this you had this meaning of selling a particular product of you know advertising Gucci sandals what Coons was doing in his artwork was commenting on it he was trying to comment on this lifestyle he was trying to he was trying to comment uh, in a rather nasty way how these uh, pictures are portrayed and it had a much more deeper meaning than just promotion which was there in Andrea Blanche's uh, um, picture. Now, I see there's something in the chat. I don't know. Shidaj, if it's important, please feel free to cut in and, and just let me know. Now, we take the questions at the end session. Okay, so, so, so here the court was essentially satisfied that, that, that you know, the, the, the purpose was very different. And therefore, there was some fair use attached in this particular photograph because it was transformative in nature. The meaning of the original work was transformed. So if you see the shoes or if you see the picture in the sandals in the left photograph, it has a different meaning, which is promotion. But if you look at the same picture in the, in the right-hand side uh, artwork, it's, the meaning has gone much beyond just promoting. The meaning is all about commenting on the Gucci sandals. It's about commenting on, on the magazine cover picture in its own way. So there is some new meaning added to it and therefore the purpose and the and meaning of the work is completely transformed. And that's an important factor of fair use. And therefore there was some fair use found in this particular picture. Another example is also this, some of you may recall playing uh, with Barbie dolls. And another artist came up with uh, with, and with an artwork which showed similar Barbie dolls, but in a, in, in, a more parid, in a more parody way. Now, for those of you who may not be aware, a parody is essentially making fun of the original work, critiquing the original work with its own funny elements. And the court here felt that this artwork would fall under fair use because again, the meaning is, 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 is transformed to another level altogether because the meaning in the Barbie doll was meant uh, to be a toy which was meant to be played by a certain set of children. But on the other hand, the meaning in the artwork, which you see on the right of your screen, was commenting on Barbie doll. Because some of you may be, may be aware that Barbie doll during the 1980s was under huge criticism for you know promoting unfair body standards, for promoting fair skin, for, for promoting these body standards, body standards where every girl has to to be thin or has to look in a certain way. So this artwork was commenting on that. The artwork was, was criticizing the Barbie doll. And the court felt that there was essential, there was transformation happening and therefore there was failure. So there was no, there, I mean, so, so, so this claim was successful. Now, when you talk about internet, it's, it's another domain altogether. And I, and I have six, four minutes. I, don't, I can quickly talk about it. Now, when you, when you go into the world of internet, it's again a huge domain altogether. Um, it's, it's years of study and intellectual property protection is having a really hard time in keeping up with the internet because now everyone's on social media, everyone's on Facebook, on Instagram. Instagram is trying to come up with policies where it can be more user-friendly, it can be more interesting for, 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 for people, for, 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 for kids of a certain age. So therefore, you have something called share, you have something called stories. You can immediately share a photograph with your friends. You saw a meme, you could immediately share it on your story, you could immediately reshare it, you could post it on your phone or feed. But if something copyrighted work comes into place, then would you be able to reshare it? So the question always here is that if you started resharing these works, can somebody sue you for copyright infringement? And these days, you also have cropping pictures, right? You can always click a picture and then you can actually crop the, the credits under it. And when you reshare it, it may appear that as if it's your own work. So is that liable for copyright infringement? These are some really interesting issues which people are trying to understand these days. And uh, you know, social media uh, and in general internet, you know, internet um, um, bodies are trying to come and trying to answer these questions by, by bringing out or, you know, reforms in their policy policies. Now, when you but now what you see on your screen is essentially this photograph which was clicked on the left uh, by this by this photographer called um, Russell Brummer. You can also see credits 
uh, down under the photograph. And you can see that it was a time lapse photograph, which was split of this neighborhood in Washington, D.C. And one day we saw that a part of this picture was also used in another carnival poster. And the, the, the poster was essentially promoting that what all you can do in DC. And, and this picture was used without um, grammar's content. So the legal issue here was that whether this kind of usage of this crop stock photograph on a film festival, on a carnival website, uh, to you know, illustrate this this list of nearby tourist attraction, whether this kind of usage is um, fair use or not. So, considering all of these four factors, which I just spoke about, the court felt that copying here it 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 essentially fails the ultimate test of fair use because it's 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 click it's it's taking a part of the picture, it's using it for the same meaning which is getting more attention to this particular neighborhood. And the, the meaning and the purpose is, is essentially the same. So you can't call it for key. So you, you can't essentially call the defense of fair use here. Now, another very interesting um, example is uh, this particular instance. Richard Prince is another very popular appropriation art, artist. And in 2014 here, he presented this installation and this was called New Portraits. Now what he did was that, um, you know, he printed these various Instagram photos on large canvases and, and, and you know, he added his own Instagram style comments, the comments below them. And the show led to a lot of backlash, a lot of multi, multiple, uh, you know, Instagram users. And you can actually, I mean, I just screenshotted, uh, if that's the term, screenshotted. Yeah. If I took, I took a screenshot of the person who was also bewildered by this usage because she did not know that her picture was being used as an as an as an artwork in some in some gallery which was getting a lot of money and she felt that she's also supposed to get some money out of it right because it's her picture altogether so you see this post and i've highlighted it for convenience the part where she thinks that permission should have been taken so here the court rejected i mean this case is still undergoing and later recent developments are that court felt that that there was some potential in this case for corporate infringement. So you see that these questions are always there. I mean, these days things can get even more complicated because you have this option of embedded photographs. Embedded photographs are, are essentially where you click on the photograph and you are and you place a universal resource thing, a URL in the photograph. And when you click on the photograph, you're taken to a different website altogether. So you so you click on the photograph thinking you're you're going to land somewhere else, but you land on another page altogether. And why people do that is because they want to increase their views, they want to increase uh, you know their website visits because that helps again monetarily. So if you put a picture publicly, you kind of agree that 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 you know more people can use it. So these days on Instagram, you have so many people, you have so many content creators who are putting out their fashion blogs, wish blogs. I mean, it's 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 endless, it's it's flooded, and and this lockdown has kind of only helped it increase multifold. So if you so 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 most of their pictures are public, they have their accounts public, and the idea till now is that if your account is public and if somebody else is sharing or resharing your photograph, uh, that's allowed. Because the moment you made your account public, you're, you're essentially giving Instagram the the like the, the power to be a license, you're a sub license to give the artwork to somebody else. So these are some of the issues. Uh, it's always best to go and look at the terms of use which Instagram or Facebook has. They though they do very conveniently mention that we won't allow uh, you know usage of any copyrighted material. It's still very tricky. I mean. People out there, they know all kinds of ways to get, get around it. Now, when you know all of this, let us now revisit the case study which we saw in the initial um, part of the lecture. And again, these are different photographs. And let's just take a minute to think that what claims can both these parties bring? So, of course, since we're talking about fair use. Uh, you know, uh, the artist can claim that I created the work in a different element, in a different meaning altogether. The meaning of Sesame Street was to be an educational TV show, whereas the meaning of my installation, as in this installation, 
I mean, if you were, if you if you read up more on it, it's it's just a Google search away. You will see that the artist claims that that uh, the meaning of the work is an escape because when you see the blue bird, you see that the blue bird is 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 very glum. The blue bird is looking out into endlessness, into is is thinking about something, and it, and probably the blue bird is just a step away from flying off. You know, and he also he or she also has a ladder in his or her hand. So it's essentially the blue bird is thinking of escaping, and that's the meaning of the of the installation, according to the artist. That is very different from the meaning of Sesame Street, because in Sesame Street, the big bird is essentially this happy go lucky character who is playing around with kids, and you know, all of that thing. Things are very different. So that is one claim which the artist can bring in. Now, of course, um, uh, Mako Sesame Street can bring in copyright infringement. They can say that we had copyright in the show. We had copyright in all the characters and nobody can recreate something similar without our permission. They can also say violation of moral rights, which we saw. Uh, they can also, I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, the artist per se can also talk about this particular aspect which says that uh, stock characters cannot be given any protection. It's essentially this idea which says that there are so that in the entertainment industry you have so many similar elements that if you started protecting each and every element, then you are not inducing creativity. You are not letting others work on it. So this is this is one claim which uh, which you know the artist can can bring in. Now on the other hand, um, Sesame Street makers can ask for some preliminary injunction. Some of you may be aware of how it works. It's essentially asking the installation to be brought down. It's essentially asking the artist to stop uh, working on this artwork at all. And of course, uh, the artist can also bring in this claim on the other hand, that, that I am not distorting the character. So, you know, violation of moral rights actually has no grounding here. So these are some of uh, the claims which can be brought in. I would be happy to hear, of course, after the session, what you all think and what uh, what other elements can be brought in. Now, I wanted to talk about this. And Shitinj, can I take five more minutes? I know it's 12.3. Can That's I take five minutes? Sure. Sure, no. OK. Now, in India, I now I'm out of the country, OK? So just, just to be clear, I see a lot of people uh, or, or I see a lot of lectures where they talk about theory, but I also want to talk about a few potential opportunities which you as students can explore. If at all, this lecture made you think about something or if at all you're interested in intellectual property. Now, there are so many career opportunities for you out there. Uh, you can go for industry practice. If at all, trademarks, copyright law interested you, you can go for litigation. Now, litigation in Bombay High Court is, is happening a lot. Uh, but intellectual property is is also getting a lot of uh, attention in the Delhi High Court. You just 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 pull out Delhi High Court judgments, and you will see that the the, the bench is really active these days in giving out intellectual property decisions. Now, of course, COVID has kind of uh, put a break on it. But if you're somebody who is who to whom litigation excites you and to whom intellectual property is something very interesting, you can go for it. In litigation, in terms of litigation, a lot of work is happening in trademark. A lot of work is happening in copyright. For patents, you would have to pass the patent agent exam. And that, that is for somebody who is really interested in how technology works with law. So in, in, in copyright and in trademark litigation, you will, you will deal with a lot of uh, you know, registrations. You will deal with a lot of um, exceptional use. You will deal with a lot of rejection usage because how it essentially goes is that you file for a, for a trademark or a copyright registration. And then the office, uh, you know, uh, either either allows your work or it either rejects your work before it publishes it for some uh, objections. So a lot of work is happening in that area. So if you're somebody who's interested in litigation and in, and in this IP law, then this is something which you can look at. Now, IP law firms are increasing in number these days. Uh, there were not so many IP law firms 10 years ago as they are now, and I'm, and I'm speaking about India, by the way. As of now, I'm not speaking about overseas. I'm only talking about India right now. Um, IP law firms like uh, Renfri and Sagar, um, you know, uh, RK Divan, these places I have interned at, and they have some really good practices. RK Divan go to the Bombay office, not the Delhi offices. 
um yeah anand anand um sai krishna uh fidus law chambers there, there are just so many of them and i would be happy to share a list if if some of you would like to get in touch so law firms also have their different teams they have their trademarks team they have their copyright team and their copyright teams they have their objection team they have their registration team so so so, so their wings their work are really divided so law firms is something which you can also look at now there are also government organizations like the, the like the copyright office you also have the ipab the ipab stands for intellectual property appellate board um some of these places also offer internships like i mean i'm talking about the government organizations of course you can always look for internships in, in ipb law firms and litigation uh, chambers but you can also look uh, for internships in government organizations and interning is a really good way of going about it because you get to know whether you like this kind of work or not whether you enjoy this kind of work or not whether you see yourself making a career out of it or not and it's also good for the employer because if the employer knows you beforehand you have a better chance of getting a job there so you have a better chance of getting a pbo offer now again i'm assuming they are all students here and that's why i'm talking about all of this i don't know if there are any practitioners here um if any of you is interested in research you always have professors to go for now covid has actually helped in that because a lot of professors are uh, at home and i mean they're working from home uh, and this particularly is a great time to contact professors to be their research assistant because this is the uh, end sem for a lot of universities uh some part of may june some part of also july probably given the academic schedule uh, professors are comparatively free and they they are they're dedicating their time for their research projects and they're always looking out for research assistance now working with professors help you for two reasons one they give you they give you good experience two they help you with build contacts so if you're somebody who's looking into getting into academia or research you can always contact these professors and you can ask them hey uh, you know I'm, i'm a student and i would love to work with you if at all you have an opportunity so uh, i mean if you have an opportunity to work for i would love to be considered you know, shooting out these mail so it's it's just about googling uh, you know if you're interested in copyright search for copyright professors in india or overseas also i mean these days you can also you can also contact professors overseas because it's all work from home all you need is good uh skill sets and internet and of course a laptop so i see that professors uh they they they, they really are helpful with proactive uh kids so take care of that if you if uh, ip research centers at some universities also have good internships to offer nlsiu i remember they had released their internship uh, call for interns only recently i believe so if you have a linkedin account which you should then 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 you should follow all these pages and you should be aware of these watch these opportunities which which can come your way now if you're somebody who wants to do an llm um sorry before llm if 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 ip law interests you you have a lot of extra uh, courses like the wipo and the l courses wipo again is world intellectual property organization you have wipo summer schools you have the copyright expos by howard law mind you all of these courses are for free and uh, though some of these courses have a very rigorous uh, application process but if you if you get through then you are exposed to a very good course for free so why do dl courses are rather simple rather simple to apply for but they will expose you to really they will give you some really good materials they have some really good classes and discussions uh, and they're all they're all like diploma courses they are like the like two months three months which you can do while you're attending your regular classes or while you're regularly doing the benefits of these extra courses again are dual uh just to whom i said this uh but i just i really think that this part is i, I mean i have Ma'am, really you can take as long as you want that's not an issue oh okay okay i'm sorry it just came out as a burst <laughs> sorry for my reaction no uh because i have received feedback that that this part of the lecture is always more helpful than others for students but now the lesson quickly ending it now so uh these extra courses as i was saying they they have dual benefits uh of course it gives you more material it gives you more to think about it gives you more to work on more important more importantly it exposes you to how the education system overseas works 
which in my personal opinion is extremely important. If you don't step out of your comfort zone, you will not know how the outside world functions. And these courses are a good way of going about it. Now, I'm not, I'm not endorsing any of these. I mean, I, I'm not getting any money to, to, to talk about them. They're really good ones. And I have done all of these courses. And that's why I speak out of personal experience. And um, secondly, having a good course, extra course in your resume uh, looks very nice because it gives, it tells the employer that, 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 that you did some extracurricular activities in academics. That, that you were proactive, that you really wanted to learn more, and you have more knowledge in your field of area. So, 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 so do give, uh, so, so do look out for these extra courses if at all intellectual property is something which interests you. And of course, if you want to do an LLM and IP law, it's all about research. It's all about looking which universities have good courses to offer. I have done a lot of talks on LLM and IP law. Um, if any of you is interested, you can just get in touch with me and I can share those links with you. I think most of them are also open uh, links. I think you, just, you can just Google Miharika Salar uh, LLM uh, talks. I think there, there, there are two or three talks I think, where I have extensively talked about how to go about researching for universities where you want to study, where you can study, which university will fit your pocket because I say all of this with the caveat that not everyone can afford another degree. And I completely understand that, uh, especially if you want to go overseas, it's not easy money. So everything has to be taken into consideration and then decided if at all you want to get another degree in this course or in this area of law. And of course, these are some of the IP law, law blogs which you can follow to keep yourself updated. IPCAT is very uh, interesting. IPCAT is run by this amazing professor um, in Sweden, uh, Professor Rosati, and uh, she's doing some amazing job there. So I say IP, of course, by our very own professor, Shamnath Bashir, who uh, very recently uh, left us. But uh, these are some really interesting blogs which will keep you updated you know, of what's happening in IP law. And uh, if somebody, of, if any of you wants to take a screenshot of this slide, you can take so now. But if at all you want me to pass on these slides, I would love to. And yeah, that brings me to the end of it. Uh, I was, I'm just showing off my text savviness by including my QR code. <laughs> you can just scan this QR code and you can land directly at my LinkedIn profile and I would love to connect with you. Just send me a, a request. And um, a lot of conversations or, and a lot of LinkedIn conversations really can help you with a lot of opportunities. So I would love to answer any questions there. And uh, that's my email, narkaroslar.gmail.com. Feel free to drop me an email. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. That's all from my end. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The session was uh, really enlightening for us. Uh, I'll just read out some questions from the q and box. Should I stop sharing my screen? Sure, ma'am, sure. Okay. There's no issue with that. Yeah. So first question is from Sanket Shah. He says, Namaste, ma'am. Could you please provide some insights on upcoming artificial intelligence revolution in domain of art? For example, if an AI program creates an art, so will it be patentable? Right. Thank you for that question, uh, Sanket. Namaste. Uh, now, the interesting part is that AI does not, uh, artificial intelligence does not really concur with intellectual property in terms of trademark or copyright. It's happening a lot with patents and it's happening somewhat in copyright. Now, I would suggest you to, uh, to Google this term called Rembrandt. Let me just uh, chat, type in the chat box for you. You can just Google this. And what, what happened here is that it's essentially a case study where uh, an artist, where a machine uh, drew a very popular uh, vintage painting. And of course, when the Rembrandt came into the picture, it really started questioning that, you know, if, if, if machines started making paintings, then will that be patentable? Will that be copyrightable or not? Not patentable. Do note that patent is meant for novel creations. Patent, if at all, would be in the robot. 
not in the creation what the robot makes. The creation which the robot makes, that's my timer, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so if, if the robot is making a creation, then that would be subjected to, if at all, to copyright law. Because that's, that's, that's an artwork. A patent would be on the robot, not the creation made by the robot. So do take note of that difference first. Um, second, authorship and, and ownership is a huge debate. Uh, those who argue that machines cannot get uh, copyright in the artworks they make, they argue, uh, which I kind of agree with, is that the machine is made by us humans. And the algorithm which is fed in the machine to create that artwork is the algorithm which was fed by the human being. And the algorithm was a creation of the human being's mind. So no copyright can vest with the robot. The copyright can only vest with the maker of the robot. But those on the other hand who argue that robots also can get some copyright protection, they believe and now that's and 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 this is this gets very technical and and I'll not go into details on because I can uh, that becomes the risk of confusing a lot of people. But a lot of robots these days, when the algorithm is fed fed into the robot, the algorithm is in such a manner, you know, uh, which 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 allows the robot to take its own decisions. So the so the, so the algorithm does not let the robot to take automatic decisions, right? Which it's, it's not essentially telling the robot to do this or do that. It's telling the robot that you can do this in case of this, or you can do this in case of this, or you can do this in case of this. And then that decision is taken by the robot. So the robot needs to get copyright protection. So these are the debates in copyright protection in general. There is very less uh, development per se, but you can also look at NFTs, uh, just, just putting it out there for you. This, this essentially stands for non-fungible uh, tokens. And this is a very interesting development just, uh, just one or two months ago, where this particular artist, uh, you know, sold all of a collage of all of his paintings in, in, a, in an AI format to a Singaporean. And now the Singaporean has nothing but, I mean, I mean, worth a million, millions of money, by the way. So, so and, and that's called an NFT, a non-fungible token. Now, again, I'm not going to the technical details of it. So that's why I've shared it with you. If you're interested, you can just Google these terms and see what's it, what it's all about. But these are some really interesting developments where the question is that whether artwork, uh, you know, if, if at all, they are combined in a certain way where you can't see it on paper, you can just store it in a memory chip. Would that be worth millions? Because apparently it is, because it was just sold two months ago. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting debate. I can't give you a black and white answer, but I can give you leads so you can have a look at these resources and you can form your own opinion. I personally believe that that uh, a lot of these algorithms are, or algorithms are actually fed by the human beings. They are a creation of, of us human beings. So if animals cannot get protection, then robots are all, also cannot get protection. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Vishveshwari Matholia. She, say, uh, she says, uh, what areas of criminal liabilities can be covered under IPR? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, and the answer is no. <laughs> Not a lot of criminal liability is out there. If somebody, uh, it's, it's, they're, they're all civil litigation cases. You can, you can offer, you can, you, can, you can approach a court of law for civil remedies. Like you know, uh, like 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 you know, a takedown notice. Uh, if if at all you know what what that is, is it's essentially you approaching the party, approaching the court of law, saying that hey, you have copied my work, and I am asking you to stop the production of the copied work right now. And if you don't stop, then I will approach the court of law. That's called a CND notice. That's called a cease and desist notice. CND notice. Uh, these are all civil remedies. They don't happen in criminal cases. And if the person then does not, still does not stop producing that copied work, then you can approach the court of law. You can approach the court of law again for, for, for uh, civil remedies like like right, injunctions, permanent injunction, preliminary injunction. Uh, you can you can I mean the the major remedy available out there for you is to ask the court 
to tell the defendant to stop producing that work immediately. You can also some some civil remedies or uh, like damages can also be can also be asked for court of law. Damages is essentially you asking for some uh, some part of the proceeds, the monetary proceeds which the person made out of the copied work. Or just in general, some damages because the person was found copying your work, and now you need to get some money out of it. So these are some of the civil remedies which are available. In my knowledge, I don't think criminal. No, criminal <laughs> liability is not there. You hardly see people going to jail over some copyright infringement. That's that's very. I I can't treat all of the case in my limited knowledge. Thank you, ma'am. Next question is from Swasti Chaturvedi. Does usage of pictures available on the Google by the students for the assignment purpose can lead to the infringement of copyright? Ha ha ha! Funny, funny coming from a from a student. How many images have you already copied? I, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so there are very interesting. There are two, three interesting cases in this regard, and I would be um, happy to share the citations with you if you want. If you get in touch with me, uh, a very common stance by Google over this is that they are not the makers of these pictures. They are just acting as a platform, which is helping you connect with the other website for their pictures. So what is Google Images? Google Images is one of those images which are owned by Google, right? Like if you Google something and you Google it in the images, then you have to click on that image and then you are uh, then you visit the other website which actually owns that image. So Google's liability here in this case is only as an intermediary. Intermediary liability is another very interesting concept, and if you want to, uh, you know, look into it, then uh, you can. This is what it is. Uh, but the idea is that if I am only acting as a platform, I'm only acting as a connecting bridge between two parties to connect. So my liability in that case would be very less. So in all probability, uh, if you if you copy a Google image, uh, Google may not be able to sue you. Probably the other person who actually owns that image will sue you. And that's why in most of these cases, I mean, whenever you're, uh, and this goes out for all the students out there, if you are right, if you're copying any images, or it's always good to write the source below, that where you picked out the source, either in the footnote or just in a general source link. So it, it helps in avoiding any uh, liability. It's essentially you crediting uh, that, that look, I have, no, I have taken this image, but this is the actual owner of the image. Also, it's very unlikely that people may be able to sue you because you are using it for academic purposes. And academic research is, is an exception in fair dealing. Like, like when I uh, showed my slides to you, I, I copy pasted a lot of images. Now, ideally, I should have also written the source thing, but I was told <laughs> what I did not, which I should have. But I will most likely not be sued because I'm using it for, for academic purposes. I'm only using it to address this lecture. I am not selling out these copies to make money. So um, yeah, that's that's the stance on it. You're muted, Switch. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, next question is from Jay Sanwadia. Uh, Namaste, ma'am. You told us about that uh, photograph of Oscar Wilde. Uh, if there is a documentary on him and the same scene is recreated, will it lead to any IP issues? That's a very interesting question. Uh, namaste, my regards. So if you, so, so, so a major drawback in these cases where you copy an image into a movie or you copy an image into a song, it's not a drawback, but a strong argument is that these mediums are very different. When you showcase something on, say, a page, then you look at it in a 2D format. But if you showcase something on a screen, then you're looking at it in, in a form of a movie. And these mediums are very different. And the meanings then, or the user experience, becomes very different in viewing an image and in viewing a movie. That's just one way of looking at it. So, so calling for corporate infringement in such cases 
is it becomes a little bit difficult the 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 bar becomes more obstacles are added i will not say that that it will it will not it it will help you in fair use because there are plenty of cases where where images were copied in movies or stills were copied in movies and they were called for copyright infringement that's you there there are ample of cases there it's just just uh, you can just look into it but that's that's one way that medium is very different second as i mentioned uh like you mentioned it's a documentary right so if it's a documentary on oscar wilde then in all probability if you're making the documentary then you have taken some permission from oscar wilde and if oscar wilde has consented to it then oscar wilde actually i mean it depends a lot of on it depends a lot of uh, it depends a lot on the contractual agreements which were reached by the documentary maker and by oscar wilde in a lot of cases if somebody uh, agrees that okay you can make a documentary on me then he's also he or she is also allowing for a lot of uh, uh, usages of anything which is attached to the course because it's my documentary up so in this case if oscar wilde has consented to your documentary then probably no there will be no copyright infringement but but if you made the documentary without the consent of oscar wilde only then probably you are in for a big loss yeah. thank you ma'am next question is from sushik gaur uh, good afternoon ma'am i would like to ask that whether a person can take a copyright of magic tricks and will it fall under the purview of artistic work secondly harry houdini got his magic tricks copyrighted in the earlier times do you have that kind this kind of provisions in indian law if yes that what are they uh hi good uh, good afternoon thanks for the question it's a very interesting question and there are so many resources uh, out there on this copyrightability of magic tricks is a huge huge question because magic tricks are all about a set of tricks right but some tricks have become so common like pulling out something from, like pulling out the pigeon from the cap or from the hat they're so common that you have you you may have probably seen it in various shows you may have seen it being reproduced by a lot of other um, artists now per se copyright does not uh, does not stop this kind of usage because because a lot of what, what what in this case what happens is that this particular concept called idea expression dichotomy then comes into picture and again i did not cover because it i usually take two to three classes to talk about this but today due to flaw or less time i couldn't but i will encourage you to look at this and what this what this concept is says in copyright law is that copyright law protects expression it does not protect ideas so if i thought about a novel book and um, if somebody and and i created a copy of it <clears throat> then that book is protected not the idea of the book and that idea probably can be used by someone else and if that expression of the same idea is completely different then there is no copyright infringement and why i am talking about this particular concept in magic tricks is because you can see that the idea of pulling out a pigeon from a cap is is an idea that's there but you can see that people have used that trick in different in different expressions i i i used a different cap i used a different uh, way of removing the 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 pigeon i used a different a uh, background i used a different stage setting i used a different timing i inserted probably a different trick in it before pulling out the pigeon i pulled out something else so the expression is different so in that case uh my expression would be protected not the idea and that's why you still see a lot of people doing these tricks and probably they are not subjected to copyright infringement because again expression is something which is being protected now i can't recall of any major cases which talks about magic tricks but i do recall some instances which i was mentioning in my classes but that was way back i'll have to look into my class sites for that and uh, if you're really interested again i will encourage you to write me an email and i can share those slides with you and i can just have a look at it but uh, the i mean the, the question always is that in what series the magic tricks were used 
because there is one trick and if i use it in in a different series of tricks then my expression changes and then i'm not infringing any copyright and that is the usual case in magic tricks there's also a very popular case uh, uh, you know in terms of these uh, yoga uh, yoga asanas a series of yoga asanas were developed which were considered to be very healthy and somebody else also copied and the question was that whether the yoga asana can be protected or whether that series of yoga asanas can be protected because a yoga asana may not be protected because it's it's there in public domain it's public knowledge uh, anybody and everyone can use it i mean if you start it imagine if you start a copywriting a yoga asana you won't be able to do it at home without permission you see that is a drawback of 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 extensive copyright protection So, so these are some questions with magic tricks. Um, this is what I would encourage you to look at. And again, as I mentioned, you can just email it to me, and uh, I mean, you can just email me, and I will be happy to share those slides. And yeah, in India, there is nothing specific which talks about magic tricks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Sandeep Sethia asked, uh, "Can legal heirs of owner or author renew the copyright or patent?" yes they can uh, so when so the duration of of uh, of of various intellectual property uh, differs in copyright protection uh, the the duration in most of the countries is 60 years plus the death of the author so the the the, the, the idea is that that the author has the copyright protection till he lives and the day he dies the copyright protection exists with his uh, legal descendants for 60 years longer because the question of losing that copyright is very important imagine mickey mouse having protection throughout like infinite protection then you can't make memes on mickey mouse you can't create similar cartoons to mickey mouse you can't you can't you can't recreate mickey mouse merchandise you can't wear a mickey mouse t-shirt you will have to seek protection or you will have to seek permission all this while and you will have to pay very exorbitant uh, licensing fee so in order to do welfare for the society it's always important that copyright protection is loosened after a certain point of time and that's that sets a public public versus private public rights debate all the time so uh yeah to uh, answer your question that's the duration in copyright in trademark it's 10 years in patents it's 10 years it's always renew- renewable uh but to answer your question directly yes it can be renewed by a legal heir because the moment somebody dies uh it the rights automatically go to the legal um heirs yeah daughter son wife whatever it is in fact you will uh, i'm sorry sorry just just one quick note in fact you will come across a lot of uh, litigation especially in the us where say uh, like this one particular case where michael jackson song was copied and michael jackson was dead so michael jackson's uh, family uh, initiated that copyright suit so these rights they 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 transfer to the legal lands yeah thank you ma'am Uh, Harshit Tomar asks, "Good afternoon, ma'am. As we uh, have lots of Bollywood movies, copy the ideas from Tollywood and Hollywood uh, along with their poster design. So, is it an infringement of copyright?" Ah, uh, good question. Uh, hi, good afternoon. So, the idea always is, I mean, the the magic is in the contract. So, I talk a lot about theory today. but the moment you step out of college and the moment you decide to enter the industry if at all you want to get into law firms and if you want to get into practice a lot of your work will revolve around reviewing these contracts and what you will see in a lot of these bollywood remakes is that they are made by the same producers they are made by the same directors and if at all they are made by diff- and and if it's by the same producer director then there is no question of infringement because the same person like like look at ar rahman remaking his same music in in i mean i don't know how many of you know this song uh but this song was is in tamil is in telugu is in hindi look at these youtube videos their their videos are also same i mean the video starts in the same way where the where the, where the boy is looking at the girl in the building and all of that uh 
but if you see they're all produced by the same person i th- i think ar rahman is behind osan i'm not sure but uh, my, my what i'm trying to say is that uh, in, in at least the indian fraternity you will see a lot of uh, remakes being made by the same person and if at all uh, if it, if it's re- it's being remade by somebody else then uh, these rights are invested in these in these contracts a lot of the contractual liability passes on to the to the uh, original filmmaker and uh, we usually don't see people contesting it because of course there is a contract to support it and secondly audiences in say tamil cinema they are usually not the audience of hindi cinema and the audience of hindi cinema is is usually not the audience of tamil cinema usually no usually i mean i know a lot of people who love more in tamil tamil cinema but are hindi people but this this is the usual idea and how this helps is because a hindi maker knows that if he makes a hindi remake then that is probably not that that probably will not be watched by the tamil maker and the tamil maker knows that his audience is not is not being distracted so when the arrangement is there then corporate infringement cases become very grave because there's a mutual understanding that the audiences of both these cinemas are very different and uh, uh you know a lot of this drops down to money a lot of this drops down to monetary benefit and if they are assured that it will not impact their ticket sales then they usually don't have a problem with it and of course there's contract to support it or rights to remake the same movie to 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 remake the same songs to copy the stills to copy the poster they usually there in the contract and that is where law firms uh, you know come in to to review these contracts yeah thank you ma'am uh, next question is from shraddha mishra does news reporting come under the purview of ipr i mean if a confidential stories broadcasted by two channels simultaneously can one sue the other to what extent yeah uh news reporting is usually an exception uh because the idea is that um say the say if somebody wanted to re- uh, to uh to report the recent uh storm talk on it then that wouldn't be purview to copyright protection because then only one person will be able to copyright uh, will be able to report that particular cyclone and if only one person is able to rep- report that particular cyclone it's not helping the public it's not helping the society it's i mean what is the what is the purpose of of news reporting it's to let it's to make the people aware it's to make the people know of the facts which are going on and if that is also protected then it does not help the society it's it's limiting access it's limiting reporting of facts and therefore it's an exception in a lot of cases it's an exception at the fair use i mean fair use is fair use is, is is a judge made doctrine and with period of time there are cases which have suggested that news reporting is under fair use. and in fair dealing you have a direct exception just look at copyright act uh, section 52 section 57 the indian copyright act and you will see all of these uh, all of these uh, fair dealing um, exceptions and there you have news reporting explicitly mentioned to answer your second question if a private uh, dialogue or a conversation or something with the private life is reported there's a case in the us where something similar happened again i don't recall the name of the case exactly but you can just write to me and we can talk and i can share the details with you and there the idea was not about copyright then the question of privacy rights and personality rights came in because if you are reporting something negative about me without my consent and more importantly that's not true then i can sue you for personality rights and privacy rights but if that's true then your case may become very uh, very weak because you are because then the person is only reporting facts then in that case you can you can question that okay i know it's true but it's my it's my story to tell you know and that is also then very very subjective if say somebody is talking about my 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 private life say my my love life then then my case becomes stronger in a court of law where it's something very personal to me but if somebody is reporting my involvement in say a public scam then my case becomes uh, uh weaker so it's so it's very subjective so i i hope that answers your question there are many parameters attached to it 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question is from Yashasvi Sharma. Uh, when is an artistic artist eligible for resale right protection? Right. So there's something called the first sale doctrine. Just typing it out for you. What this essentially says is that if I sell my product, then I lose my rights over it. So, and if, and if there is a resale happening, then because I have already given up my rights in when when the first sale happens, then that then even the monetary benefits which come out of that resale is not supposed to go to me because I have already given up my rights on it. Now it's not usually people don't do it in a blanket yes or no. People give I mean there are they 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 decide to give up only some rights so that they keep getting some money out of it like you know. Limited rights like redistribution, somebody else can take care of. But the other uh, uses like like completely copying the same work will still be with me. So so in in such cases, uh, uh, you know, limited rights are given up. Uh, but yeah, first sale doctrine is something which you should be looking at to answer your query better. Okay, ma'am. For the questions, we'll stop because due to time restraint, we cannot. Take more questions. Yeah. Uh, so, do we have more questions, or uh, how do we go about now? Uh, I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, Professor. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, first of all, let me just say that I don't belong to the uh, law field. So, my question might sound very uh, laymanish, but uh, something that has been happening recently. Uh, is uh, regarding the vaccination and the patenting of the vaccination. For example, <laughs> if Jason Salk uh, uh, would have patented his polio vaccine, he could have made $7 billion in today's uh, money. Uh, this is something that would save lives. So why is it taking so much time for, you know, actually, uh, you know, taking the, uh, considering the decision that needs to be taken because, you know, people's lives are at stake and ultimately who decides, is it uh, BIPO that decides or who would decide that there is no requirement of patents or uh, vaccines will not be patentable? So, Professor, you should be looking at something called compulsory licensing. Uh, I have typed type, type, type in the chat box for you. So, the problem with patents is that it's a very lengthy process. Uh, and in this case scenario, we still have vaccines coming in where, you know, like, like, uh, like Sputnik was recently approved. We are still in talks of, of you know, giving, of uh, allowing more uh, overseas made vaccines to be given out. Why patent is not very easy to get is A, uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of geopolitics involved in this. We're all aware of the fact that there were there were some countries, some there were there were there were these first world countries. There was the global north, which invested heavily in the in the making of these vaccines, and they know that if they started patenting it, it, they may uh, receive, um, uh, you know, a lot of criticism from from those uh, people who will then start getting these vaccines uh, free. Uh, and if you started patenting, patenting it, then it may be difficult. It may be very difficult for uh, for access. I mean, let's just get the idea straight. What is a patent? A patent is you essentially getting some protection over a technology which you invested in. And now, and and it's essentially you asking for protection that hey, I invested my money in this. I invested my research and development in this particular medicine, and only I should be allowed to distribute this. So patent in these times of crisis may reduce access. I mean, imagine countries like us, like India. We are in dire need of vaccine right now. But if, say, USA started patenting these vaccines where they don't want to share the uh, recipe of these uh, or, or the or the medical formulation of these vaccines, and they will start asking extra money if, if we want a vaccine from them, then access to the global south I mean, we are still in a better position, it seems, because we have a lot of other countries with, with vaccines, and now I'm getting into other debate of the death. But it may limit access. So in these cases, you have something called compulsory rights, where it's it where WIPO says that 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 some that you can get patent protection over your particular formulation, but you will have to keep it restricted to a certain, you will have to keep the 
amount of the money restricted which you ask when you start reselling this and composite licensing is something which is the, which is in the hands of domestic laws and domestic uh, um, um, you know a country legislation so in this case if so, 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 so the debate is less about patent the debate is less about why is composite licensing not happening yet that okay you take you take that we don't we, that's okay but if you know that and, and, and composite licensing the essentials are that if you are in if you have protection over a certain medicine which is beneficial for the the health of public in general and in these times of crisis i think covid vaccine is something which could really use composite licensing because we are still getting it we're still using it and we still don't know what the medical formulation might be or not right i mean we have our own home grown vaccines but there are various vaccines otherwise other otherwise else too so the question is then not about patent the question is about compulsory licensing i mean look at other punawala being criticized for for asking so much money for these uh, vaccines from states after so much of pressure he finally reduced it and but by 100 rupees so we we it, it's it's still a debate that you know get patent protection but limit your price and that is what compulsory licensing is so uh, i mean if you're aware of recent developments india and south africa has been really pushing the world trade organization to limit patent protection and usa came in and uh, he, they released a statement which supported india's request in in the wto and people went all ha ha about it and people went all gaga about it that oh wow usa is doing an amazing amazing job but what they don't realize is that the motion is yet to be passed and uh, showing support is one thing i mean i mean it 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 has definitely eased the way because the people are like usa is supporting such a request by a global south country but uh, we it's it's still a longer race to to get those patent waivers so what i have to say i think it will be like you said compulsory licensing would make it rational because people who have invested in the technology they'll be able to say, say you know at least get their investment out of it correct and uh, also you know it will not drive up the prices especially for developing and underdeveloped countries it can be a huge challenge if it is patented in the in the normal sense of the yeah. world so it will yeah. drive up the prices which will you know cause negative effects with the availability and the affordability aspects yeah. Yeah, and India already has done you know, a compulsory license. I think the first litigation was in two thousand seven, where this medicine was uh, given compulsory license. So we are not new to it, uh, and and it's, it's there. These are recent provisions because uh, again, this debate of public rights versus uh, private rights they always come in. And when we are talking about health, when it, when you are talking about farm pharma, then stakes go higher, right? so that's why something like compulsory licensing was introduced so i think that is the way forward if at all if things have to go ahead yeah. thank you thank you so much for answering my question shithi you may continue thank you sir thank you ma'am uh, coming towards the end of the session i shithi jaspreet on the behalf of department of law prestige institute of management and research would like to express my sincere gratitude to ms niharika salar ma'am for sharing her uh, knowledge and uh, uh, making this session so enlightening and knowledgeable and for sparing her valuable time i would also thank assistant professor kamlesh jain sir for organizing today's eml and for his vision and guidance at every step i also thank professor assistant professor nakul singh chauhan sir for his support throughout the session i also thank all dear students for being patient and gaining all the knowledge in abundance come thank you ma'am Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. I've just put in my uh, coordinates again, just in case anybody would like to get in touch, because uh, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I, I would love if if anybody would want to ask more questions, because I think I saw a few more questions in the Q and A, but we did not have much time. I'm so, uh, yeah, and let me know if you want these slides. It's not a problem. I can share. Uh, it will be great if you can share the slides with, uh, let's say, uh, Professor Kamlesh Jain, and then he can forward it to students if that's not an issue. Sure, I would love to do that. I can I can share a PDF version of it. Uh, Shita, you can share it here in the chat also. I'll download it and share it share it with the students. I don't have it in the PDF format as okay. of now, not, not uh, and it will take sure. me two minutes, and I don't think we have all of that time. 
but uh, i will share it la- share it later yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We can i share will, later I... that's not an issue and i would i would also like to thank you for sparing out your time uh, i personally oh, feel that uh, the effectiveness of a session is judged by the number of questions that are asked after the end of the session so we can see that you know people wanted to ask questions that was because of the paucity of time that we were not able to take all the take, take up all the questions and me not being from a legal background i was also interested in listening to your session especially with all the pop culture references as a matter of fact when you uh, mentioned rembrandt my first uh, the, the first place my head went to was the uh, introduction song of the tv show friends because the creator <laughs> of that song that song was also rembrandt so i thought you were talking about that rembrandt so a lot of a lot of pop culture references actually help uh, people you know correlate with the uh, you know the topic and uh, thank you so much for taking this session and we would love to have you uh, in our institute in person whenever we are uh, through with the pandemic and we are really looking forward to uh, some some more sessions with you in the future thank you so much for taking out your time ma'am sure sure thank you thank you professor for those really kind words and See, interestingly, I don't think after COVID pandemic, people will uh, take the pains of inviting people on campus because now I think everyone has 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 gotten used, not even used to, but they know that this is so much more convenient. It's it's less money. It's 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 all uh, it's yeah, it's just more convenient. So I'm not really sure actually. I'm looking forward to this. That how many guest lectures in person actually happen when the world opens open more? Actually, I personally <laughs> feel that you know the nothing can replace a physical interaction. uh sure. because you know actually you get real time feedback just by looking at the faces of the participants so yeah, you you know from somewhere, somewhere as a teacher you are able to gauge whether you know the, the thing that you've mentioned or the concept that you are trying to explain is well understood or not so sure. and plus chitra ji as a student he will also tell you that at times online classes uh, can become boring it can be monotonous because yeah. you know it's only one person speaking all the time and uh, students feel a little shy in interjecting uh, in between and asking yeah. their questions so it feels like a one sided conversation but uh, having said that uh, we would really love to have you uh, once the pandemic is through and once it's safe to travel we would really love to have you on campus and interact with all our students sure sure likewise likewise i would love to be there so um, yeah thank you thank you so much for the invitation it was i thank had a lovely so much, time ma'am. okay Okay then. Yeah, in the session now ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day and please stay safe.